Well, we are glad you are here with us this morning. My name is Matt. I'm the minister here. We are going to be in Matthew chapter 5, if you want to flip there. Uh, this is where we're going to start here in just a second. We are jumping back into our series on uh, working through the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' uh, sermon from Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And it has taken a couple months, but we are finishing up Matthew chapter 5 today uh, and moving on to chapter 6 next week. So uh, this is where we're going to begin, is just reading how uh, this chapter kind of finishes out uh, here this morning. So will you read with me starting in verse 43? This is what Jesus says. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's pray as we begin this morning. Father, I'm thankful for this day, uh, and thank you just for this opportunity that we get to be here together, that we get to open your word, that we get to worship you. Father, I just pray that right now our, our hearts and our minds would be open to what you have to say to us this morning, God. I pray that you would be here with us, that you would speak to us, that you would grow us, that you would convict us, that you would challenge us. However you see fit in our lives, God, let us uh, have open eyes and open ears, ears to hear those things, Father. We love you, and we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what he did for us on the cross, and it's in his name that I pray. Amen. So the question is, how do you want your life to be defined? What do you want your life to be defined by? Like, at the end of your life... As they are telling about who you are or who you were, what, what is the thing that you wanted your life to be defined by? Because I think there's lots of things that we uh, could have our lives defined by. And if we look realistically at our lives, we, it, our lives may say something about us that maybe we don't necessarily want. I think a lot of times, like, like there's a lot of things about me that my life could be defined by, right? Like Nebraska kid, Cornhusker fan, those aren't great things necessarily to be defined by all the time. Thank you three people who got that. <sighs> Even, I mean, let's, let's go to a little bit bigger level here. Like Denver Bronco fan, Scott, where are you at, my brother? Like, come on. It's not great time for, uh, to be defined as a football fan in this area of the country. But, but look even bigger than that. Like, right, would you be defined by the guy who's got lots of trophies mounted to his wall? Or are you, are you the people that were defined by always up at the lake or, or how you were always chasing that promotion or how you had a big elegant house or maybe you had always the nicest car or the, the newest tech or whatever it is or whatever it could be? How is your life defined? And how does that match up with what Jesus is calling us to be about here at the end of Matthew chapter 5? Because here's, here's the reality, like if I can spoil it for you, Jesus calls us and he calls believers to be defined by their love for others. Above everything else in our life, above whatever else that we have going on in all our lives, Jesus calls us to be defined by our love for others. And this is exactly what he unpacks in this, in this section here as chapter 5 comes to a close. Believers are being defined by their love. Let's look through this. Let's jump back to verse 43. Jesus starts it this way, and he says, You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, Jesus makes a reference here. Uh, again, it's not an exact quotation, but, but more to a reference of a fairly well-known passage found in Leviticus chapter 19, where it says, don't take revenge or bear grudge against members of your community, but love your neighbor as yourself, for I am Yahweh. It's, it's not a quote, but rather a, a reference to this passage found in the Old Testament. But what's interesting here is that there's also this, at, this added little bit on the back end of it. Jesus says, love your neighbor and what? And hate your enemy. Not sure what your Bible says, but my Bible doesn't say anywhere that we should hate our enemies. Nowhere in these pages of the Bible does it, does, are we commanded to hate anybody around us. But, but remember what Jesus is doing here. 
And remember what he's been doing since the beginning of this chapter. He's taking the well-known kind of common interpretation of Old Testament laws and sayings, and he's deepening them, and he's expanding them uh, to, to, to a much greater thing than what they have been. Pharisees would take the Old Testament law, and they would twist it, uh, and they would manipulate it to fit what they wanted in their lives. Jesus is taking that and going back to its true inter- interpretation from the Old Testament. Some would say that hating your enemy can be inferred from the Old Testament from places like Deuteronomy chapter 23 or Psalms chapter 139, but honestly, this is a stretch. And it's not consistent with the rest of uh, Scripture's teaching. It could also mean, possibly, some would say, that, that people are saying, well, um, you're, you're only supposed to love like your neighbor. This, means that, this, mean, this verse means that, that we're really only supposed to love the people who are actually our neighbor. Well, you could manipulate who is our neighbor as well. I, I don't believe really that's it. If you look at a holistic kind of view of Scripture, of what the Old Testament, New Testament say together, God shows his love for people consistently. No matter if it's his chosen people or if it's people who are far from him, God still shows love to them. What Jesus is calling believers to here is much bigger and deeper than the understanding uh, of what the Pharisees had. Let's continue on, verse 44. He continues on and says this, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. This is so important for us to remember. This is so important for us to remember. Jesus is calling us to love those around us like he loves us. This is so important. There is no standard for for God for who he does and does not love. He shows love to all people. And this is really the flip side of what we talked about a couple weeks ago. So a couple weeks ago, we talked about the idea of kind of leaving our rights behind and not pursuing retaliation when somebody does something against us. This is the flip side uh, of that same conversation. Uh, We were called to turn the other cheek. We were called to, you know, give of your coat when you're asked Uh, for your shirt. We were called to go the extra mile. We're being called to give up our rights and not retaliate when we feel like we want to in our lives. This is what we're talking about today is really uh, the opposite side of the same coin. Jesus is just continuing this on from a couple weeks ago. Uh, One side of this really is to be a little bit passive uh, with our enemies who want to take advantage of us. Today, the other side of this coin is that we need to be active, even with our enemies, through love. And so you have this passiveness when it comes to retaliation. You have this activeness when it comes to love. And here's the reality, and I know this is going to be news for you. Acting this way, especially to people who are not close to us, who would be considered our enemies, acting this way in love is not normal. Right? Right? This is not natural for us. We we don't default into showing love to people who have wronged us, right? Anybody? No, didn't think so. We don't naturally do this. We, We don't automatically just love people who hurt us, who have wronged us or who have hurt somebody close to us. We naturally move towards retaliation. That's just kind of built into who we are as people. We move towards withholding love from them. But what Jesus is saying here is that believers are to be defined by their love. Believers are to be defined by their love. Followers of Jesus love their enemies. Followers followers of Jesus pray for their enemies. What better way, church, what better way is there for us to have our hearts softened towards somebody than to pray for them? What better way for us is there to have our hearts softened towards somebody who's hurt us, who's wronged us, who's taken advantage of us or somebody else, than to offer up a true and sincere prayer for them. And and what's the point of all this? I mean, what is Jesus really really getting to? Well, he, he said it there. He said, so that you can be sons of your Father in heaven. So you can be sons of your Father in heaven. This is the definition of a child of God. That loving people and praying for people, even those people who have persecuted you, 
This is the definition of a child of God. But Jesus doesn't just stop there. He now brings in a comparison uh, that kind of seals the deal here. Look at verse 46 and 47. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? If you love those who love you, what, what good is that, he says? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Jesus makes a couple comparisons here that would have hit home for his Jewish hearers, his Jewish listeners here. He, Jesus calls them out of, of loving only those people who love them back, for showing favor for those who can only give back to them who are just like us. Jesus says two things. One, Jesus says, guess what? You are no different than the tax collectors. You're no different than those who uh, have sold themselves out to Rome, who now take advantage of their fellow Jews uh, in order to gain wealth. Even they do this type of thing. You're no different than the tax collectors, they said. That would have hit home. And if that wasn't big enough, Jesus says, and also, you're no different than the Gentiles, than the, those who go out and worship false other gods, false gods, those who, who are not God's chosen people. Even they show each other love. You are no different than these two other people groups, Jesus said. You would think that the religious elite, you would think that the, the famous, the, the noted religious leaders would be better than these lowly tax collectors and these pagans. But in reality, what Jesus is saying is they are, they are absolutely no different. They, too, only care about people who are like them and who can repay them and who can offer love back to them. In Luke chapter 6, it's interesting, uh, the same concept is put in terms of giving somebody a, a loan. If if you loan someone money and you know for certain that person is able, able to repay you and is going to repay you, you haven't really sacrificed much. You just kind of gave them a loan and you're going to get it back and everything's good and you're sure of it. But if, but if you give a loan knowing that that person can't repay you or you're unsure if they're going to be able to repay you, Jesus says that's when you have acted more nobly than the pagans because it, it takes a sacrifice from you. And here Jesus calls out the attitude that has been prevalent during this time. He calls them to a, different, a deeper faith. He calls them to allow this to change how they have been living their lives. Ultimately, he's calling his followers to be defined by their love for others. Jesus is calling his followers to be defined by their love for others. And here's the reality, like if we can push pause on where we're at in Matthew 5 for a second and step back and look at what we have talked about. Dennis talked about the Beatitudes, but think about just the last six weeks, what we have kind of looked at. As Jesus has been making these comparisons here in this last little section in Matthew 5, you know, you've heard that it was said this, but I say this. The last six weeks he has kind of done that. I mean, think about this. We have talked about how first our... our Envious and negative thoughts in our minds are as bad as murdering the man. Secondly, we talked about how our lust and desires for others in our heart is like committing adultery. Then the next week, how divorce is like, solidify, is, is like the solidifying act of adultery in a marriage. Fourth, uh, we are to be about p uh, truth in our lives. We're to be known for truth in our lives. Two weeks ago, we're, uh, we talked about how we're not to be about our rights and, and, and getting retaliation from those who wronged us. And then this week, as we look at how we love each other, just, just think about that for a moment and what Jesus is saying here. And, and think about that list and think about those things we've talked about. And we can look at that and we can go, that's heavy, right? Like there's a lot there. Jesus is calling us to a standard that maybe most of us didn't sign up for initially, right? Like this is, this is difficult. This is a lot. It's a very comprehensive list uh, of what righteousness looks like for the believer and the follower uh, of Jesus. It, it paints a picture of what the characteristic of a, of a follower of God is. And if we do this thing and if we live this life, we move closer to being uh, to, to, to the character of God who he desires for us. And we can look in that and we can think that's a lot, but if we then move on to verse 48, it puts a whole new level of this as well. Look at verse 48. Jesus says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. 
Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. I can read through those last six statements, look at the last six uh, sections that we've covered over the last several weeks, and I can go, wow, those are hard. Wow, this is a new level uh, of, of, of righteousness in our lives. This is taking, you know, captive, ca- captivate the murderous thoughts in my mind and, and understanding the impact of my lust and not retaliating, not demanding my rights uh, and, and showing love even to people who have wronged me. Like, that is hard. Being perfect is a whole new level of crazy, right? Like, it's a whole new level of hard. You get to verse 48 and I'm supposed to be perfect just like how God is perfect? Any takers on that one? I'm just like, this ain't going to work out because I know me. I know how imperfect I am. I look at the guy in the mirror and I'm like, yeah, he is messed up. And I think you're the same way. How am I going to be perfect? And we've heard this before. Like, this isn't new for us. Like, if you go back to Leviticus chapter 19 says, be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. If you look uh, in, if you, in Luke 6, it says, be merciful just as your heavenly Father is merciful. Like, how do we do that? How, how do we live that life? And is, that, is it even possible for us to be like that? Well, if we go back to verse 48 there and we look at, at that word perfect a little bit, if we, if we dive into that word, the, the Greek word here, I told you I'd keep teaching you Greek, so here we go. The, the Greek word for perfect there is teleos. Everybody say teleos. Yep, you nailed it. Uh, it, it means complete. It, it means mature. It means whole. It, it's the idea that something has grown to its more advanced state uh, of, of being. And this, what this word and what ultimately Jesus is, is calling us to is not that we should be flawless before God. It's not that we should have zero sin in our life or that we should never ever make a mistake in our, in our lives what jesus is calling to us to is to live our lives to grow and to mature and to be whole in him jesus is calling us to live our lives to grow and to mature and to be whole not in anything else but in him in who he is he's calling us to be mature in our love for others even in our love for our enemies he's calling us to be mature in our envious thoughts and intentions that we have towards other people. He's calling us to be mature in our longing for the people and things around us. He's calling us to be mature in the responses even when we're, taking it, when we're taken advantage of. In advantage of. He's, taken, he's calling us to be mature in the interactions with other people that we have and how honest we are. He's calling us to be mature in how we live our lives. Jesus is calling us to be mature. Think about the most mature people that you know. I mean, think about the most spiritually mature people that you you know. Guess what? They are still sinners saved by grace. They are still sinners that stumble, that have faults, that struggle too. Nobody is perfect. And if you think about the giants in the Old Testament, think about the heroes of the faith that we put up on pedestals, the ones that we kind of idealize here and we kind of want to look after and we want to think, well, I want to have a life like him. I want to have a life like Moses or David or, you know, whoever. I want to live my life like them. Guess what? They are sinners too. And if you really dive into their lives, it's not as great and as perfect as you might think it is on the surface. Perfection is not something that uh, any one of us has. The call for believers is to be mature and to be complete and whole in how we follow God and interact with others around us. We're called to be mature. We're called to be complete. So go back to where we start. How do you want to be defined in your life? How do you want to be defined as a believer of Jesus, as a follower of God? What does your life say about you, Christian? What does your life say about you, followers of Jesus? What does your, your priorities say about you? What does your checkbook say about you? What does how you live your life say about you? What does your interaction say about who you are and how you are defined as an individual? Does your life define you as a follower of Jesus who loves hard, no matter what the situation, no matter what the per- person? Does your, does your life show you as somebody who, who puts people first, and puts tasks and opinions and agendas second? 
Or are you defined by something else? Are you defined by your knowledge or the answers that you give? Are you defined by the rules that you claim to follow? Are you defined by uh, the position that you are in and that you desire to be seen as? Are you defined by the possessions that you have, your stuff, your achievements that you have? Are you defined by the things that you have done or the words that you have said or the recognition that you've received? How are you defined by? The band uh, for King and Country has a song. You may have heard of this song. It's called The Proof of Your Love. Uh, I want to read the lyrics to this song. They are simple and yet so very profound and speak right towards this. The, the lyrics of this song say this. If I sing but don't have love, I've wasted my breath with every song I bring, an empty voice, a hollow noise. And if I speak with a silver tongue and convince a crowd but, but don't have love, I leave a bitter taste with every word I say. And if I give to a needy soul but I don't have love, then who is poor? It seems all the poverty is found in me. Let my life be the proof, the proof of your love. Let my love look like you and what you're made of. How you lived, how you died, love is sacrifice. So let my life be the proof, the proof of your love. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You probably recognize this. If I speak human or angelic languages but do not have love, I am a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains but I do not have love, I am nothing. And if I donate all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body in order to boast but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Church, take inventory of your life here. Take inventory of your heart. Who do you love? Who do you not love in your life? What keeps you from loving people around you? What keeps you from loving people who have wronged you? And I hear you, right? Like, like Matt, you don't understand what they've done to me, right? Like, that's easy for us to get to. Matt, you don't understand how they have wronged me. Matt, you don't know how they have hurt me. Matt, you don't know how they took advantage of me. Matt, you don't know how they hurt somebody I love. Matt, you don't know how wrong they are. Matt, you don't know how their answers are not right. Matt, you don't know how right I am. Jesus says, be perfect, just as I am perfect. Be holy as I am holy. Be merciful as I am merciful. The standard for believers is higher now, and it's love. Forgiveness is hard. Working through this is hard. Showing love is hard. And we're going to talk about forgiveness in a couple weeks, so we're not going to let you off the hook for that one. It's absolutely necessary for the believer. And if we're unwilling to show love to the person who we feel wronged us, who took advantage of us, who we have issues with, if we're unwilling to show love to that person, we're unwilling to follow in the footsteps of Jesus who did the exact same thing for each and every one of us on the cross. Every single one of us has sinned against God. Every single one of us has been unloving towards God. We have wronged him, and we deserve eternity in hell. And God showed us love through Jesus. And unless we're willing to show that love to other people, we're unwilling to follow where he has already led. This is why we as believers, we are defined by our love for other people. And so what if we, church, what if we did this? What if we lived this life? What if uh, the body of believers that followed Jesus, what if we led with love first? What if our interactions with each other was defined by the love that we have? What if we led with love and how we interact with people who are far from God? I can tell you that it would change us, that we would be different. Each one of us personally would be different. Church would be different. Our city would be different. People would look at us and want to know what's up with us. It would change us, and our relationships would look different. I think it would look like, as parents, how you continue to love your kids even when they don't necessarily deserve the love that you have for them, when they continue to sin against you, when they continue to disobey, you continue to love them. I think it would look like that. 
I think it looks like the opposite of that as well. When, as parents, you make mistakes, when, in, when as parents, you fail and you drop the ball and your kids continue to still love you. I think it looks a lot like that. I think it looks like marriage. When we continue to love your spouse, even when they come up short time and time again, through the best and through the worst, we continue to love. I think it looks like the real family who accepts somebody into their family, even when they don't seem to care, even when that individual doesn't seem to want to be a part of that family. I think it looks like the family who forgives and accepts the son-in-law who killed their daughter several years later. I think it looks like what happens every month at Feed a Family, where a group of people gets together and, and loves on every single person who walks in that door with their struggles and their issues and their sicknesses and their excuses and their poverty. And they lead by loving heart. I think it looks like what Celebrate Recovery looks like here on Saturday night, where people bring their addictions and their alcoholism and their uh, substance abuse and their lifestyles and they're met with love and pointing them back to Jesus. Church, I think if we did this, I think we would look a lot like Jesus. Church, I want to look like Jesus. And that starts by us leading with love in our lives. Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful for your love. And I'm thankful that um, your love for us was so great that Jesus went to the cross for, for me, for every single one of us so that we can have a relationship with you, so that we can be restored with you, God. I am thankful for that. Let us not look at that and accept that without turning that around and offering it to other people around us. Let us love hard. Let us be known as people who love each other, and let us be known as people who love other people hard. Let us lead with love. Let us never give up loving and in that let us continue to point people towards you father thank you that you have never given up on us thank you that in our sin and our struggles you continue to love us let us offer that as well we thank you we love you it's in your son jesus name that i pray